captivity from uh, Babylon back to the land of Israel. And so what we have done is we considered the first return as we looked at the first six chapters of the book of Esther, uh, Ezra. And then we now looked at an account and a portion of history that took place within the first and second return. The second return, which would be the return in the book of Ezra with Ezra himself, takes place in the latter part of the book of Ezra, starting in chapter 7. So in between chapter 6 and 7, we find ourselves here in the book of Esther. Chrono uh, according to the chronological order, this is where the story of Esther actually takes place. So thus far, we've been able to see that the Persian Empire was, without a doubt, uh, in power, that there was great rule among the Persian Empire. We know that to be true. The second thing that we saw is that even though Persia was, you know, in charge and there was great rule within, within the empire, uh, we also take note, too, that um, the Lord was still in control. And we know that this was a result of the disobedience of the Lord's people to be taken captivity. Then, as they were dealt with in the captivity, they have come and have not yet been able to rule and to lead as the way they were really called to. So what we find now in the book of Esther is we see how God works providentially uh, for his people and how God truly is sovereignly in control. And so this morning as we look at chapter 4 in the book of Esther, we will see that no matter the circumstance or situation or the powers that be, we have been really learning a lot about the sovereignty of God and the providence of God and basically how God has moved among his people and really <clears throat> that his people should be encouraged regardless of the circumstance or situation around us. Chapter 4 is going to bring up quite a bit for us to consider. In chapter 1, we saw how the Lord, regardless of who was in power, could move upon the hearts of a Gentile king, so to speak. And he did so with uh, King Ashishurus. And we've seen how the Lord can use a situation within a kingdom to advance his purpose. And he did so with Esther as she now became queen rather than the queen that was before her of Persia. So God clearly places Esther, I believe, at this particular time, in this particular place, for this particular purpose. So I believe that this was all God's doing. So God's not surprised by any of this that is transpiring. Neither is the Lord saying, oh, look at this great opportunity that I have now to do this work. No, the Lord has orchestrated this entire thing from beginning to end, even so much that he orchestrated the captivity. And so the Lord is with his people every step of the way. Now, when you get to chapter three, we see that life as usual among the Gentile king of Persia, Artaxerxes and um, or excuse me, Asasuerus, um, we see that his, his henchman, if you will, his second in command, his Haman. Haman is the man who, uh, for whatever reason, is abusing the authority that he has. Now God takes that abuse of authority and uses that to advance his purpose. So there's nothing that's done here that catches the Lord off guard. As a matter of fact, the Lord uses everything to fulfill his purpose. Even King Ashishurus removing his wife Vasti as queen, the Lord used that for his purpose so that Esther can be made queen. And then we see that Haman becomes second in command and uh, the Lord uses that for his purpose because now that Haman has kind of focused his attention on Mordecai because for whatever reason, Haman feels that he needs to have respect and so he's given this great authority, and we went over the purpose of authority and why we as Christians have a responsibility with our authority. We are only given authority because of who Christ is. And, and with that very authority that we are given, we know that it's for the purpose of serving one another. Jesus gave us that perfect example. We looked at that last week. Now, we see here that Haman abuses this authority, but this also doesn't catch the Lord off guard. This also doesn't do anything that would, that would cause, you know, the plans to be messed up or God's plans to have to, or God to resort pretty much to plan B. It's not the way it works with the Lord. 
And so everything is as planned. Now, what's interesting here, church, is that in chapter 3, we see that this man, Haman, was able to sway the heart of the king to make a decision that now has been set in stone. Take note of that, because <clears throat> the Bible clearly teaches that once the law is put into place, it could not be altered. This was a custom of the Persian kings. And so remember that once the law has been placed there, they would have to now leave the law in its place and for it to be fulfilled. So word has gone out that the Jews are to be destroyed, all because of Mordecai's refusal to honor Haman. And remember that perhaps this goes all the way back to, you know, the history of Haman. We've seen his genealogy and, and where he comes from, from the Amalekite people. He, in a sense, represents God's greatest enemies. And remember that they were the ones in Exodus 17 who attacked God's people as they were in the wilderness and they were coming out of Egypt and and though the Lord was caring for his people in the wilderness, there were many that were older and there were infants and there were those that were sick and so on and so forth. And what did the Amalekites do? They, they seized upon the opportunity of weakness and they attacked God's people from the rear flanks. And with that, they really declared war against God. And from that point on, the Lord casted judgment upon them and said from here on out, the Amalekites are our enemies and wipe them out every chance you get. And this was what he gave Saul as a command to do. So Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, was given this decree, if you will, to wipe out the Amalekite people. But rather than wiping them completely out, he spares Agag for, what, for personal reasons for that matter, as a trophy, I would say. And it was because of that very thing that Saul disobeyed the Lord and the kingdom was removed from Saul. And so then we see that it was later on the Amalekites that actually came back and killed Saul. You see, when God gives you a command to take care of something and God shows you about personal things in your life that you need to deal with right then and there, you got to do it right then and there. If not, these things will come back and they will lead to your demise. And if God is pointing his finger to something and he's saying, deal with it now, it's because God's giving you the power to do so. God doesn't just say to deal with something without enabling you and giving you the ability to do so. For the believer, God has given us his spirit. He get, he's given us his word. He's given us the power of prayer. He's given us abilities where you and I can seek him and trust in him and hope in him. And all this is for the benefit of the Christian. And so with this very same thing, Saul did not fulfill what God called him to do. I guess the question this morning would be for each and every single one of us, um, don't make your personal life more important than what God's called you to do. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be revealed by fire as to what sort of work it really is. And there's nothing wrong with careers and ambitions and good paying jobs. But I'll tell you something, those things don't advance the kingdom. What advances the kingdom is the gospel. And yes, those are means that are necessary in our lives to live, but they're not means by which we are possessed or taken controlled by to where we're not able to do the work that God has called us to do. And so you look at these things and you say, these are here so that God can get the glory in my life. And this is why... We are to always seek the Lord as to what his purpose and plan is for us in whatever season of life that we're in. Oftentimes, so many think that because they're living a good life, that they're living a godly life and you're not living a godly life. All you're living is an earthly good life. And that will cease when this world ceases. So here you have Esther who has probably the greatest career the greatest purpose, the greatest plan, the greatest position, the greatest paying job. She has everything at her fingertips. Here she is, second, or rather than second in command, but the queen of this vast empire that has 120 provinces that is really ruled from India to Ethiopia. Vast, taking great portions of Iraq and Iran and Syria and Israel and Egypt 
Sudan and all this great region that if we were to look at a modern day you know, map, we would see how vast this empire is. And yet here's Esther, the one whom the king chose out of 400 women to now replace his wife who refused one of his orders. And yet what we find here now is that Esther has a position, Haman has a position, and Mordecai also has a position because as we've seen, remember that when she was within the uh, uh, house of the king and the, and the palace for that matter, and the Bible says in verse 9, it says, and she was moved with not only the maidservants and all that were with her, it says to the best place in the house of the women. We also see here that in verse 10, Esther had not revealed her people or family. Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day, look at Mordecai pace in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. This is interesting because it reveals to us that Mordecai also had a position. He had a position where he had the ability to go right to where the women's quarters are and be able to kind of check in on the welfare of his niece, who everybody thought was his daughter. And so what's interesting here is we also see at the latter part of the chapter <clears throat> that the Bible says here that in verse 21, it says, In those days while Mordecai sat within the king's gates. There's only two reasons to sit within the king's gates. One is for political reasons, for governing, for civil authority. The other is for, as it being the marketplace. But for whatever reason, we see that Mordecai was not there because it was a marketplace. Mordecai rather was there because it would seem that he had some type of influence even in the decision making as to who the next queen of the Persian Empire would be. So I lay the foundation this morning in saying all of this for us to keep in the backdrop of our mind as we look at chapter 4, that everybody has a position. And last week we looked at these authority or these positions of authority that we have. How are we honoring the Lord with what he's given us? What I believe the body of Christ misses and loses today is we are clearly, as pastors, preaching to a very selfish group of people. And it's true. When you read the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, the ones that had ulterior motives or hidden agendas or their desires were southward because they wanted to get something out of it, the end result was always disastrous for them. But as Jesus would give us the perfect example that all of this is for the purpose of bringing God glory. What does it mean to bring God glory? It means that everything we say and do is for him and not for us. Well, how do I bring God glory in my marriage? Then do what the Lord says to do in marriage to bring him glory. For the wives, the command is very simple. Respect your husbands. And for the husbands, the command is very simple. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. I've been married 17 years, and I fail miserably at that. And I think that oftentimes we, we become selfish and we lose sight and we read over these passages as if these scriptures don't apply to us because, you know, hey, well, I've been here long enough. No, listen, nobody, nobody usurps themselves over scripture. It's the very word of God, if read and taken in properly, that breaks us and reminds us every single day that we're no really better than when we first started. We're still sinners in need of a Savior. We've been touched, yes, by the Lord, but we're no better than we once were. It's only because of Christ's righteousness. There's nothing you have done that has made you any better. It's all because of who Christ is. So the beckoning of his word and of his spirit and in prayer and devotion to the Lord is what we should be doing on a regular basis. Why? Because every day we're to repent of the sins that we've committed in our lives. And the whole purpose is that you've been given authority, I've been given authority, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is and what Christ has done. 
And so with that, what do we do with the authority that Christ has given us? Well, you know what I do with it is I try to figure out where I can fit it into my life. No, you need to figure out where your life fits into what Christ has given you. Because then everything changes. I've learned so much since being the senior pastor of this church and within this last year, realizing more and more my purpose and what the Lord has called me to do. And it all goes back to who Jesus is. For I've had my ways, my ideas, my thoughts, my desires, and I'll tell you guys something, nothing has ever gone the way that I've wanted it to go. Even to this day. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. What if the Lord would have given me what I wanted? It would have never been his will or his purpose. And what we need to understand is the authority that God has given us for the time that we do have it. If you do not know already, the scriptures do teach that by this very thing, this is how you will be judged. The Christian does face judgment, 1 Corinthians 3. Don't lose sight of that. Esther will be judged. Mordecai will be judged. Haman will be judged. Ashishurish will be judged. All these will be judged. And so God's purpose and plan has already been laid out. The believer on this side has the privilege and the opportunity to be a part of what God is doing, not because we have anything to offer him. All because his desire is to work his purpose in and through earthly vessels, you and I. Why does God have to do that? Because God's at work. And when a person ever questions and doubts the work of God, just look at the vessels he's using to fulfill his purpose and his plan. This is all what's taking place here. So the whole point is this. We see how Haman abuses his authority. We're going to see here how Mordecai and Esther use the authority that the Lord has given them for the purpose of bringing God's glory. And then also, there are those who are these unnamed characters. We're looking at named characters, and, and unnamed characters can be someone who is just perhaps not even mentioned, but it will say a, a man or, or a woman or a boy or a girl. We find those instances in Scripture, right? But yet we don't realize when we look at that how big of a part they played in the work of God. And then there are some that we call no-namers, not necessarily meaning that they don't have a name. It's that they do have a name, but their name's not really attributed to anything big that they've done. And we'll see a no-namer, if you will, here in chapter 4. So with the foundation being laid on authority and what we're doing, the charge and the command, let's now consider here chapter 4 with the backdrop of our mind being reminded of what we looked at last week. In chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says this, When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put a sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Look with me very quickly at verse 15 of chapter 3. The Bible says the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. Look at what it says here. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. You see, both the people of the Persians... And the Jewish people were perplexed. They were perplexed. Why? Because out of nowhere, this decree goes out and says, every Jew must die. And remember, the date had already been given. Remember that Haman had, had come together with his men and they, and they casted lots, if you will. The, the, the Bible gives us the idea here in verse 7 of chapter 3. It says they cast per, that is, the lot. And remember what we read about in Scripture in regards to this very casting of the lots. Yes, well, even though they casted lots, we know that it was the Lord's doing. According to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 35, the Bible says that, yeah, lots may be casted, I'm paraphrasing, but ultimately the Lord is the one that chooses what is shown. 
So technically here, Haman is excited because in his mind, there is an expiration date for the people that he desires to ruin. And listen, guys, he's ruining all the people because of one man. And, and, and notice something here with this in mind. He's upset because Mordecai does not give him honor, but Mordecai, true to his heritage, you see, we looked at that last week in great detail, the heritage of both men, Mordecai, true to his heritage, refuses to bow to him, and yet he says this is the date in which they would die. So the decree goes out. Remember, he gets the king to be able to, really the authority from the king, and then the word goes out, and these couriers in verse 15, as we just read, hastened by the king's command. So the people are perplexed. Now when the word gets to Mordecai, notice what it says here. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. What does this mean to put on sackcloth and ashes? It's, it's very simple. Jot this down if you're taking notes. The whole purpose of sackcloth and ashes really is an outward sign of inward distress. An outward sign of inward distress. And we see this used throughout the scriptures, as a matter of fact. We see there in the book of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 6 and verse 26. The book of Daniel in chapter 9 and verse 3. In the book of Matthew chapter 11 and verse 21, it was a sign of, of really uh, something outwardly as they would put the sackcloth in ashes. And it was really of what was taking place in the heart, that there was sorrow, that there was mourning. But it also referred to repentance. 2 Samuel in chapter 1 in verses 11 and 12. In 2 Samuel chapter 13 in verse 19, it also was a sign of repentance. We've seen that in the book of Jonah also in chapter 3. And so the taking on of sackcloth and ashes was not only just a time of sorrow and mourning and grieving, but it was also a sign of repentance, a turning to the Lord. And so here we could say that when Mordecai learned all that had happened, his came really as a result of perhaps, I think, a little bit of both. It would seem here in verse 1, it says, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Notice that this is him crying out. It doesn't say to the Lord, but it would seem perhaps that Mordecai knew that his action caused this issue. Him not giving honor to Haman. And so in a sense, you see here that, that, that really, perhaps Mordecai is now taking this more, it's already personal, but more as this was my doing because I did not honor this man. And so what you have now is you have Mordecai here just looking at this, and the Bible says this very clearly, that he cried with a loud voice, and it was a very bitter cry, and so... He knew, also knew, I believe, of the law that is written by the Persians in that the law could not be altered. So remember there in chapter 1 in verse 19 when King Ashishurus' wife, Vasti, didn't come and you know, reveal herself in front of him and his drunk friends. And, and so because she refused to reveal her beauty to these men... And there are various reasons as to why she didn't. The people or his men looked at that as if she was refusing a command and an order from the king. And then they begin to what? They begin to now manipulate the king in saying that you need to deal with her because if you don't deal with her, then all the people in your kingdom are going to do the same thing that she's done. And then they take it a step further. They said, you need to consider our wives too. Our wives, all the women are going to refuse this. And so they said, speak this command because we know according to Persian law, the Bible says in chapter 1 and verse 19, if it pleases a king, let a royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persian and the Medes so that it will not be altered. Now remember in the book of Daniel in chapter 6, in verses 4 and 12 and 15, in chapter 6, remember that that was one of the things that we've seen, that once this Persian law was, you know, given, it could not be removed or altered. 
And so perhaps this could be another reason why, too, as to why Mordecai let out this bitter cry, so to speak. You see, and so it could be for two reasons. One, well, you know, by of dishonoring him has brought this about to all the people, not just me. And or also, now that this decree has gone out, it can't be changed. So this is a very serious matter. So what do you do in a time like this with the authority that has been given to you? Well, we see what Mordecai does. His, his response reveals who he is, not only to those who were at the gate, because remember that when they asked Mordecai, you know, what his issue was, remember that they, they, they were questioning Mordecai. They says, why don't you pay homage to the king or, or to, excuse me, Haman? And remember that Mordecai revealed to them as to why. It says that in verse 4 of chapter 3, it says, for Mordecai had told him that he was a Jew. So this is why we believe that Mordecai was more faithful to his heritage than anything, because as a Jew, he knew exactly what Haman represented. He represented, first and foremost, God's enemy. Why? Because of Haman's people, that he was an Amalekite. And so the issue goes all the way back to when the Amalekites attacked God's people. And the Amalekites shouldn't even be on the scene here. But remember, this is the last time we hear of the Amalekite people in Scripture. They should have been wiped out when God gave the command to Saul. And Saul didn't do it. And so now Haman looks and says, you guys should have been, I don't, I'm just paraphrasing, you guys should have been dealt with a long time ago. How am I going to bow down to you, that which has already been cursed and condemned and should have been done and away with? You're rearing up your head again and getting involved in the things of God when you have no part in what God is doing. And I don't know, that's just my thought. Because oftentimes, guys, listen, when the Lord once again gives us this command to take care of things, this is how we should view these things when they rear their head up once again in our lives. And so here... Looking at this for a moment, we could see, too, that perhaps it's the Lord finishing what he started. Why? Because God ordered Saul, who was of the tribe of what? Benjamin, to wipe him out. Well, Mordecai is from the tribe of Benjamin also. And so we could see here that regardless, listen, men and women, if we don't do what God's called us to do, he will use someone else. Ultimately, God's going to fulfill his purpose. The buck doesn't stop with you. And if the Lord knows that you're not going to do it, he'll just push you aside and raise someone else up to go and fulfill what he's got. Listen, God's not up there sad and worried. Man does. I get sad and worried when I see people not fulfilling their callings and not keeping their commitments. But just because I get sad and worried and emotional behind the whole thing doesn't mean that God does because he doesn't at all whatsoever. God will just raise someone else up. Why? Why shouldn't God get all emotional behind it? Because that's not the God that we serve. He's a God of purpose a God of vision, a God who has a plan, and he's not moved by the emotions of man or the selfishness of man. Listen, if you start something and you never finish it, ultimately, it'll always come back and you'll never be able to complete anything because you have not proven yourself. There is what is required of us, especially when it comes to the church. For leaders, it says they first must be tested. Oh, that's scriptural. From Genesis to Revelation, God has always tested his people. What God does not do is he does not tempt his people. That's the work of the enemy. He's the tempter. God is the tester. And a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And so what we find here that I think is really important, guys, listen. What will Mordecai do with this authority? Well, I believe that what God's doing here is he's raising up Mordecai for this purpose to finish what he had desired to do with the people of Amalek. And so this is just God fulfilling his word and, and completing it. And I don't know about you guys, but 
If that bit of information this morning doesn't do anything for you, then it's obvious that you're not in God's will. Because what this did for me is it revealed to me that whatever the Lord has shown me, that he's going to fulfill it with or without me. There's more comfort and joy in that than anything. I don't look at it as I could perhaps lose my position. I look at it as, you know what, Lord, this is why I need to be flexible, open, sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit because you have a greater purpose that is way bigger than me. God at the same time has a plan that is so vast that you and I are just little smidgets in the part of his entire plan. But even these little smidgets are important to God in the midst of this plan, but not too much important where you change the direction of what God is trying to do. So God's not going to wait around for you to get things right. God's not going to wait around for you to get it all together. God's going to continue to move forward. You have to be willing and ready to continue to move with the Lord because God is constantly at work. We are the ones who stop working. So God's not caught off guard by this. Mordecai's crying. Not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And the Bible says that he went as far as the front of the king's gate for no one... For no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. This is interesting. So what does Mordecai do? Well, here's the authority that Mordecai has. We see that he obviously has access to this place, correct? But it also says here that nobody went to the king's gate with sackcloth. Now, this is interesting. Remember, I told you guys a bit of history in between chapters 1 and 2 that a period of time has transpired. This king, Ashishurus, went and tried to defeat the, the, the Greeks. Remember that. And he failed to do so in 480 B.C. And coming back, defeated, without victory, perhaps depressed, they then place these women in front of them, in front of him, excuse me, to bring pleasure to the king, perhaps maybe to take his attention and focus off of his loss in the battle. Clearly, that's what history reveals, and it's believed that even this is what they're doing here in the word. And perhaps the reason why somebody's coming to the king's gate, they cannot be wearing sackcloth because remember, sackcloth is a sign of mourning, a sign of sorrow, a sign of grief. And in other words, they didn't want the king to be bothered by someone's grief. So it was actually forbidden for someone to come to the king's gate. And, and so much so when you study the law here clearly of the Persian Empire, you'll see that it was also forbidden by death. You could be killed for this. But Mordecai goes before the king's gate clothed in this very manner. And notice what we see here. No one was allowed to be in this very place for this particular reason. Perhaps that no one would be allowed anyway, in any way to distract the king. And clearly this would be a distraction to the king. But for the most part, the king obviously didn't come to the gate. The king obviously doesn't know what Mordecai is doing. And neither does, if the king don't know, listen guys, that means that Esther has no clue. All this Mordecai is doing as he hears the horrible news and also reads in his very own hands the death sentence that now has been delivered to God's people who have just recently come out of captivity, rebuilt their temple, and now have been living in obedience to God's word. And when God's people begin to do what honors the Lord, the enemy comes in full swing to try to attack. Mordecai takes it a bit personal as he did from the get-go by not honoring this man. Mordecai lets out a bitter cry. And so we see here that Mordecai's going to the gate served its purpose. Take note of that. He got Esther's attention. And we cannot be silent when lives are at stake. And this is what Mordecai is doing. Lives are at stake. It wasn't just his life. It's the life of all the Jewish people in the land. And the Bible is very clear according to Proverbs chapter 24. And verses 11 and 12 reveal to us the type of heart that you and I are to have as Christians. When lives are at stake, it says this. Deliver those who are drawn toward death. And hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. 
If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? And he who keeps your souls, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? Deliver those who are drawn toward death. We're not to remain silent. And this is what Mordecai was doing. He, he was going purposefully to get attention. Now we see here in verse 3, look at, And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping among the Jews. Notice that. With fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Here's what's interesting. What we see here is that the people imitate Mordecai's response. This is what they resort to. This is what God's people know to do. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. In other words, what they told her was, they said, Mordecai is at the gate, and he's in sackcloth and ashes, and he's letting out a bitter cry. That's what the Bible says. He cried with a loud, bitter cry. And so now she gets word, and they're telling her, hey, your father, who's really her cousin, so to speak, they says, hey, he's out there and, and he's just crying bitterly and there is sackcloth and ashes and she already knows that it's a sign of mourning. What could possibly be going on? So what does she do? The Bible says, then she set garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. In other words, she's like, you really need to change because if the king comes out, Mordecai, you're done. And you can see, once again, Esther's response reveals that she uh, had no knowledge at all whatsoever. But what she did know to be true here is that he could easily become a victim of the king's policies. So her response reveals that she had no knowledge also of the decree of the king. She didn't know why Mordecai was out there. So she had not read this decree. And this is what's interesting. Here she is, the wife of the king, but yet she doesn't know what the king is doing. And so the Bible says here, then Esther called Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. Now, this is interesting. She has no clue. She sends Haytack over there, guys. Listen, and we don't know who this Haytack is. All we know is that this is a Persian name, and the name means verily or truly. But this Haytack, guys, listen, now is placed in a position where probably one of the greatest Decisions of the day has to be made, and this Haytack is given this responsibility. Notice that we can learn from a person Haytack that we don't even know. We see that he faithfully uses his authority, and not realizing that the authority that he was given and the position he was given really was ordained of the Lord. The Bible says here that Hatak, one of the king's eunuch, as he goes, the Bible says in verse 6, So Hatak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. You see, God uses the most unlikely people, guys, to fulfill his purpose and his task. A nobody. And this Hatak, his task was very great. You know, I remember when I was in India, I was asked the question as to, you know, the feeding of the 5,000, and, and, and we were doing a Q&A, &A and, and one of the people asked, you know, well, who is this little boy that, that, that gave Jesus, you know, uh, the loaves and the fish? And, and, and I says, I don't know. They go, well, why don't you know? I says, well, I don't know. The Bible doesn't put their name there. Well, don't you know everything about the Bible? That's how they told me. And he says, wouldn't you know his name? I said, there are many people who are not mentioned in Scripture. What about the friends that lowered their friend down that, that, that was sick? And, and while Jesus was teaching, we got none of their names at all whatsoever. As a matter of fact, even the guys that did the work uh, for Paul or Saul of Tarsus when they were going to wipe him out, those that lowered him down through the window so that he could escape. There's no record of who their names are, but yet their positions were of great importance and what they did brought great enlightenment to the word of God and the work of God. But just because we don't have a person's name, I love that. Some people are not to be recognized in the ministry. And perhaps I don't know why that is, but I do know this for sure is that none of us should have a desire to be recognized. And notice something here. This man, Haytack, here is coming, 
and his position, he probably looks at this and probably considers, wow, okay, I'm going to go talk to Mordecai and find out why he's doing this. Here with garments in hand, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. Notice this, guys. Mordecai's position, guys, was one of authority. And we know this to be true because it says this, and he also gave a copy. You see, only those in a position of authority would know, and perhaps maybe Haman, I don't know, just this thought, make sure Mordecai gets a copy. But a copy was given also, written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan the citadel. Notice this, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Mordecai requests for Esther was to go before the king. He, he says, you got to go. So Hatak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. You could only imagine now that Esther, Esther now re hears this and guess what's being said to her. Your people are going to be wiped out and your, your dad, they don't know that it's really her cousin, but your dad Mordecai out there is saying, you got to be the one to go to the king. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and gave him a command for Mordecai. So now here's Esther's response. And it says this in verse 11, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called. Take, let's stop right there just for a moment. You know what she's saying to him? She's saying, look, I understand what you're saying. I, I, I understand very clearly. I know the severity of it. But keep in mind, guys, chapter 1, verse 19 says that once this law has been decreed, there's really no altering it. It's already gone out. Esther understands that very well. Mordecai understands that very well. But Mordecai is still asking her, listen, you have access to the king. You go. Her response is, I can't just go to the king. Nobody can in all of the province. None of the men and women who lead it all whatsoever, none of us can go before the king unless by appointment. Talk about an interesting relationship that she has with her husband. Only by appointment. And he has but one law put all to death. You know what she means by that? She's not talking about the decree that was given. She's saying this, if you go uninvited, you're put to death. No one is to bother the king. No one is to go before him. And, and, and especially in this case, you know, look at what Mordecai, she's not refusing, but notice what she's letting him know. This is very difficult. You see, guys, when the Bible reveals to you and I, and Jesus made it very clear in the Gospels, what's impossible for man is possible with God. And all Esther is saying, she's not saying no. She's saying there is impossibilities in the way. And what Mordecai is asking really is a simple thing. You have access to the king. He's, you found favor in his sight. He delighted in you. You're his wife. You replaced the one who rejected him and refused him. You made him happy as he came back from war. He was defeated, rejected, perhaps discouraged, and yet you made him happy. You brought joy to him once again. And all I'm saying, Esther, is listen, do you not understand that you're the one that can help all the people? Perhaps at that moment, maybe for a second, I don't know, guys, but I just want to interject this thought. Perhaps now the realization comes to Esther as to her realizing the cost and the price that she paid to become the wife of the king. It cost her her purity. And as difficult as it might be for some, it was her purity before marriage. She had to give that to the king before he found favor in her sight. A Persian king under Persian rule. I don't agree with this movie that was done and they show that perhaps she didn't give herself. No, biblically she did. That's the high price that was paid for her to be in the position that she was in. And God used the wickedness, the lust, the sexual immorality of this king 
and he honored his daughter, Esther. And she gave up what costed her everything, ultimately to save her people. And perhaps, I don't know, but maybe this is where the realization came into Esther's mind, realizing now, wow, what a price that was paid for God's people. You see the picture here now? He who knew no sin became sin. Jesus gave up his purity because he became impure. Your sin, my sin, to save his people. I don't know, but maybe this is where the thought comes into play. We do a lot of thinking, don't we? And then when we realize that God's plans are greater and bigger than ours, then we realize where the strength and the power came to make the decision and say, yeah, that wasn't me. That was God all along. Think about that for a moment. This is, to me, is a very powerful, powerful exchange and conversation here. And God uses the wicked, distorted ways to bring good out of it. And he did. He did. Ashashurus was a wicked man, driven by lust and power and wealth and sexual immorality. But that doesn't last forever. Even in the midst of such wickedness, and sin, God still has a remnant. Esther was that remnant among the 400 women. She was God's remnant. Representing his remnant among the Persian Empire that was about to get wiped out. She says, I can't go before him like you want me to, Mordecai. This is what the law says. Except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter only by invitation that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. I, I, I have an appointed time where I go. I can't just go in there and, and my 30 days have not come up yet. I can't see him for 30 days. So Esther was not at liberty to go before the king as she pleased. If she were to go uninvited, guys, listen, it would mean death for her. So now look at Mordecai's response to her. I think this is really important. So Mordecai, so they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. In other words, Haman is going to go all the way to the very end. And you, Esther, will also be taken out. He's not threatening her. He's just saying, you need to look at the bigger picture here. And the issue now is that, think about it, his second in command is the man who issued this decree, and the king is behind it, and all he's saying to Esther is, listen, you yourself most likely will not be spared. So in a sense, you're going to die anyways. I mean, I'm not trying to say it that way, but ultimately that's what it is. And so now, maybe perhaps that little tiny phrase to her maybe changes everything. But notice what Mordecai continues to do. The Bible goes on to say here, and so he tells her the first thing, jot it down, number one. He says, Esther, you're in danger also. He says, everyone is in danger, all the Jews and even you. And notice what he says in verse 14. For if you, speaking to Esther, remain completely silent at this time. Because remember what I said, guys, when lives are at stake, we're not to remain silent, correct? He says, but if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, the second thing, jot it down as he's telling Esther, your silence will not do God's will. It will not do God's will. 
And even if you remain silent, God will still fulfill his purpose. In other words, what is he saying? Esther, you cannot stay quiet. Your silence does no good. I know what he's doing. If you've read the chapter, you already see what he's doing. He's building her up and revealing to her that this is what she was brought here for. Notice what else we see here. What was it that Mordecai was resting upon? Even with this death sentence and his bitter cry, he already knew that God had promised deliverance for his people. Did he not? Didn't the Lord do that from the very beginning? Mordecai knew Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, Genesis 17, verses 1 through 8. Notice that. He'll deliver, he'll raise, another will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. God's going to fulfill his purpose. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom. Listen, for such a time as this. Esther, do you not understand that you are a part of God's providence? You were sent here before. All this worked out so that you could be here for this specific thing. And so, in other words, the third thing we can see here after he reveals to her the first thing, he says, Esther, you're in danger too. And secondly, he says that your silence will not fulfill God's purpose and plan. And then he also reminds her that if you don't do anything about it, God will raise up another because God promised to preserve his people. Remember, what did I say? Three things we will look over in the book of Esther. One is the preparation. Secondly, the presentation. We're getting now to the presentation where she will go before the king. And then the third thing that we end with is the preservation because God will preserve his people people and keep his word. Think about that. And so the third thing is he goes on now to say here, guys, listen, is that he says the Lord has brought you to this place for a reason. The Lord has brought you to this place for a reason. That's what he says there at the end of the verse. He says, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom, to this kingdom, for that matter, for such a time as this, for such a time as this. Esther, do you not understand that you've been brought here for a purpose and for a plan? The worst thing you can do, guys, is never fulfill what God brought you to do to begin with. And every obstacle, every circumstance, people, selfishness, ambitions, and desires will be the greatest enemy to you fulfilling what God's called you to fulfill. Because when God uses the people that he's brought for this place, whether it's you or you fail to do so, he's going to use someone else. He gets the glory. I'd rather be a part of God getting the glory regardless of what I get out of it. Esther, understand that your place there is for such a time as this. You thought being queen was the greatest position and title you can get. No. It's what God placed you there for. Because ultimately, this is where God gets the glory. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Here's her response, guys. Listen. And we can see that she hears Mordecai's response. And we could see here that her spirit is lifted as if she realizes the greater purpose, in a sense, in her life. She realizes now that it wasn't just about being queen. It was about being one who can have a great part in God's greater purpose and greater plan. Think about that for a moment. So we could see here by her response, and look at what happens. We see her encouraged. Jot that down. Esther's in encouraged. Look at verse 16. Go gather all the Jews who were present in Shishan and fast for me. When she says fast for me, she's not uh, taking a, a time of fasting and prayer and, and saying that these two things are separate. No, as a matter of fact, we see all throughout Scripture that fasting and prayer are often linked together. And some of the most notable passages that we see this in is in Luke chapter 2. 
and also in Luke chapter 5. A fasting and prayer is something that is needed. And, and what is fasting? Notice what she tells them here in regards to the fast. She says, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. Notice that. And people have often asked the question as to why is there a need to fast? Well, I think it's very important to fast here. Why? Because what is biblical fasting? Well, this we do know for sure, guys. Listen, there's nowhere in the Bible where we, where we are commanded to fast. Nowhere. The only people that were commanded to fast in Scripture was only once a year. And that's given in the book of Leviticus in chapter 23. And that was during the Feast of Atonement the Jews were to fast for that one day out of the year. So what is the purpose of fasting? Oftentimes people have taken fasting in a sense to make it seem like they're more spiritual than the next person. Guys, listen, all fasting is, let me give it to you in a very simple form just so you can understand what fasting is. Fasting means to focus. Jot it down, it's the truth. Fasting means to focus. What fasting does and has always represented in Scripture is a, post, a person setting themselves apart to focus upon the Lord for a period of time so that they can hear from the Lord. Sometimes you just need to stop and you just need to fast so you can hear from the Lord. Let me say that again. Sometimes you just need to stop so you can focus on the Lord to hear from the Lord. Fasting means focusing upon the Lord. And so I love that within the scriptures that it's not a command. As you can see, I hardly pass up a meal. But fasting also is not just food. As a matter of fact, here's a couple of things that we see. Fasting, yes, requires and demands a focus upon the Lord. And nowhere is it commanded in scripture. But we see in the New Testament also that there's no commandment to fast, but Jesus did fast. So we do see the importance of fasting. So there's nothing wrong with what Esther is saying here. We do see that fasting does serve its purpose. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2, Jesus fasted. According to Matthew chapter 6, in verses 16 through 18, and also Mark chapter 2, verse 20, we see that Jesus also expected his disciples and his followers to fast. So now the question is, Am I fasting? Have I fasted? Am I obedient? Am I disobedient? Listen, there's reasons why we're to fast. And it's to your benefit. So why are we to fast? So we can look more spiritual than the other? No, Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of the day for that. But there are three types of fasting in Scripture. The first one, jot it down if you're taking notes, is limiting certain foods. Not all foods, certain foods. Daniel, in chapter 1, in verses 8 through 14, we see that Daniel and his friends refused to eat the delicacies of the king. But they ate vegetables, they drank water, they fasted from the delicacies of the king. Did not eating those delicacies make them more spiritual than the next man? No, the whole purpose was they were going to focus on the Lord God of Israel while in their captivity rather than focusing on what the king is offering and giving to them. Notice the entire purpose is focusing. Why did Jesus fast? He focused on the will of the Father. So some could refrain from certain types of food. And notice the delicacies of the king. We all like food. Amen? amen. And for those of you who didn't say amen, well, I'll have your share of food, okay? I love food. But we love food. We love to eat good. And so these are things that we like. And we look forward to it. Some of us look forward to a certain meal or a certain type of meal. You're like, oh, man, I can't wait to get there. My mouth's watering even now. That's because you like it so much. There's nothing wrong with liking something that much. But the point that's being made here is the focus is the Lord. Imagine, we often say this, imagine if you just put that much determination in the Lord. 
how powerful of a Christian you would be. That's the whole point of fasting right there. Take your focus off of what brings satisfaction to you, put it upon the Lord, and let him satisfy you for that moment, for that season. And watch what happens. The Lord just does a work in us where perhaps what it really is, guys, it doesn't make you more spiritual than the next person. Whether a person never fasts their entire Christianity or a person does fast, listen, they don't become greater in the kingdom of God. We're all children of the Lord. But people fast for a certain reason. If you don't have a reason for fasting, all you're on is just a spiritual diet. It has no substance. It holds no weight. And if you have medical conditions like diabetes and things like that, well, listen, I wouldn't recommend you to go out and try to fast. You need to go get with your doctor and find out what's safe for you to do before you go and try to do it. Oh, but I'm just going to step out in faith, you know, and I won't take what, you know, none of my, you know, insulin or whatever. Do you not know that this is the way God heals people through medication also? He's the one that gave the doctors the wisdom to make all this stuff. So God might be healing you and God might be working through medication that is prescribed to you. Take it. But fasting, guys, listen, is, is, is you can look at it in this sense that we can limit ourselves from certain foods. The second thing. Three types of fasting. The second one is fasting from food entirely. That's a different one. Completely fasting from food entirely. Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 through 3. Some will just drink water and they'll fast. And, and then the other form of fasting, the third one. There's fasting from food and water. Not eating at all. Luke chapter 4, verse 2, and Acts chapter 9, and verse 9. You see, the Lord's never called me to fast that way. <laughs> but it doesn't make anything different. But you know what else, guys, is interesting? And, and you could say this is the fourth thing. I just want to throw this in there. That fasting not only is fasting from food or anything like that. And, and here's what's so amazing. The scripture gives us a wide range. It's whatever brings us pleasure. As a matter of fact, there is also a fasting from certain activities. Exodus chapter 9, verse 15, jot it down. Exodus 19, excuse me, verse 15, and 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, and that's from sexual intimacy. And so you can fast from having sexual intimacy with your spouse. Because what does that do? That brings satisfaction. It brings fulfillment and joy to you because that's what it was created for. Within the confines of marriage, that's what it said. You shouldn't feel weird or icky. But there are times when you're to refrain from these things because you want to give yourself and focus for the Lord. Now remember, in 1 Corinthians 7, it says when you are doing this, it says to come together quickly. So that no one is tempted by the devil. If you notice that in all these instances, guys, listen, fasting is for a period of time. So what is the purpose of fasting? To focus on the Lord. And there are various types of fast. And what is fasting with these various types of fast? You know what the Bible is telling us? That all you're really doing is denying the flesh of what it wants for that moment and that season. Can you not just give into the flesh, but give into the spirit and focus on the Lord for that period of time? Some people fast breakfast. Some people fast their lunch. Some people fast dinner. But don't do it every single day. You're just on a diet. Be safe about it. But here's a couple of things before we close today because I thought, you know, I didn't realize I was going to talk this much on fasting. But I think it's important because I'm often asked these questions. And, and you know, people will say, you know, and they pray and they fast. So? Big deal. We pray to the same Lord and God. He's Savior over all. God doesn't say, well, you're a faster, so I'm going to respond faster. It's not the way God works. How do you know if someone's fasting or not? As a matter of fact, you're not supposed to open your big mouth when you're fasting. It's true. Or put on that face like, you're like, aren't you going to eat? No. Are you sure? What's going on? No, I can't tell you right now, but me and God got something going on. Once they already start talking like that, I'm like, yeah, really? What is it? I get them into, you know, 
Well, yeah, I can't really say, yeah, you can. I'm a Christian. You're a crew. Why? What are you, what are you doing? You know, you start priding them. The next thing you know, they say, I'm fasting. I'm like, you blew it already, man. <laughs> you blew it. You might as well just eat now. Well, you asked. Yeah, because you had a look on your face when Jesus said, shave. Change the look on your face so that no one knows what you're doing. You already blew it there. You see, fasting doesn't make you any greater. That's the point that Jesus was making there. Fasting is for the individual. And fasting is so that you can focus on the Lord. What do we need to fast from today? Some of you might need to fast from certain foods. I don't know. Some of you might need to fast from a meal. Some of you might need to, I don't know. You might not need to fast. I don't know. Some of you need to fast from sexual pleasures with your spouse. But whatever the case might be, some of you need to fast from watching TV. The one-eyed devil. Television. Some of you need to fast from other things. I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you what, if you're thinking, well, I need to press in. I want to hear from the Lord. I, I want more from God. Then you know what fasting is? Just taking time and saying, Lord, I'm giving this to you. Because you know what fasting really is, guys? It's not only focus and focusing on the Lord and denying the flesh of what it wants. Listen, fasting is also dying. You're bringing your flesh into submission. And so however that equates to you, don't ever lose sight of this. The Bible never commands us to fast. So it's not a command. And God will answer your prayer whether you fast or you don't fast. He will answer his children with a yes, no, or not right now. Fasting doesn't make you more spiritual than the next person. It's you focusing on the Lord. And if that's what you want to do to receive from the Lord, then that's fine. And if we do it together as a group of people, that's even better. So it's a good thing. It's just something we can practice. Like when you tell somebody, hey, maybe you should read the word. <laughs> maybe you should fast. Maybe you should pray. It's just one of these other added benefits that we have as Christians. And notice what its purpose is for. To what? Bring us closer to the Lord. Focus on the Lord. Notice that it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the Lord. That's what fasting is. I love that, man. I love it because now I don't feel like I have to fast. So at times I feel that maybe there is time for me just to get away and get to the Lord and just me and him and no cell phone and no TV and a couple of hours. You know, I, that's all I say is I say, hey, I want to get away with the Lord. Really what I'm saying is I'm going to fast for a moment to deny my flesh of what it wants. It wants to be on social media. It wants to be texting. It wants to be looking at emails. It wants to watch a show that, that is a show that doesn't really benefit at all whatsoever spiritually, but to get away to a place where you can seek the Lord, that is fasting also. It's setting yourself apart so that you could focus upon the Lord. And this is why we see the various fasts, but notice what she says. She says, gather all the Jews, and she says, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink, listen, guys, for three days. Day or night, my maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Wow. You notice what it says here? She's saying, I am all in. I'm going to let the Lord have his way. This is what Esther is saying. She says, let's go before the Lord, because this has been for such a time as this. And let's all pray. Let's all seek the Lord. And what was the whole purpose? She says, fast for me. Jot these things down very quickly, guys. Listen, first thing when it comes to fasting, jot it down. Very important. The book of James in chapter 1 and verse 5 says this, that we're to ask the Lord for wisdom if we lack wisdom. Before you fast, ask the Lord for wisdom. First thing you need to do when you start to fast, ask the Lord for wisdom. Because fasting has to have a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, you're just on a spiritual diet. That's about it. Second thing that we see here that she said was she said fast for three days. So in other words, we're to set a time. There needs to be a time frame in which we fast. Here it's three days. Jesus fasted for a longer part, 40 days. Some fast less than that. 
Some fast more than that. Some fast a day, some fast a meal, some fast a time of the day. It doesn't really matter, but you have to set a time because setting a time has a purpose. And, and fasting is not for you to change God's mind. Fasting is not for you to change the direction of what God is doing. Fasting is for your benefit. And fasting is so that you can really see what God is doing and has already determined. And so your fasting doesn't change God's decision. Oh, I'm going to fast because I want God to do this. Fasting has never been for that purpose, ever. It's for the benefit of the individual to have greater clarity as to what the Lord is doing. Most of the time in the certain circumstance and situation that they're in. Give me wisdom, Lord. I want to hear from you. I'm going to set this time aside for this week, for this month, for whatever the case might be, so that I may hear from you. I want your direction in this matter. Why? Because it's his will. It's his purpose, not ours. Third thing, jot it down, please, very quickly. Fasting should always be done with a purpose. What did Esther say? Fast for me. Fast for me for three days and nights, and my maids will also fast. And notice the purpose here. The purpose is so that she goes before the king, and if I perish, I perish. There's the purpose of the fast. Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, and Acts chapter 14, verse 23, Acts 13, 2, and Acts 14, 3. Jot it down. Fasting should have a purpose. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Guys, God will definitely move on our behalf. He will. If we're willing to die to ourselves. What did Esther say right there? She spoke what she had already determined in her heart. Notice what she says. And if I perish, I perish. Wow. Remember what Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Esther had already resolved in her heart that I was brought here for such a time as this. God's purpose is bigger than my purpose. God's plan is greater than my plan. And God's going to fulfill his purpose with or without me. Whether I perish, I perish, I'm going to go. You just need to pray for me. We will pray together. We need wisdom. We need clarity. And guess what? God will meet their need. Haman has his plan. But God's purpose and plan is greater. We might not all be fasters. And that's understandable. We're not commanded to. But I think we all can agree that there are things that we can give up for the Lord. So that we can focus more on him. Amen. Amen. So why don't you set your heart to do that? We're closing out a year where we could probably look back and say, I made a lot of mistakes. I could have read more. I could have prayed more. I could have trusted the Lord more. I could have done more for the kingdom. Guys, listen, don't let another year get away from you. Do more for the Lord.